I welcome all of you to the William W. Hay Railroad Engineering Seminar here at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Before we introduce our speaker, there's a couple of housekeeping items we'd like to take care of. One is, I think you all know, we'd like you to turn off your cell phones, please, or put them on vibrate so they don't go off. Mine's already set. Um, if we have a fire alarm, what I would like you to do is exit in an orderly fashion from either of the doors on either side of the room, descend to the uh, first floor and go outside the building, um, and please assemble on the north side of uh, Main Street by the Hydro Systems Lab, and I'd like you to use the buddy system, so pay attention to who's next to you and make sure that they've gotten out. Um, we're not expecting any severe weather today, but in the event that we did, instead of going outside, we would go um, to that side of the room and then head that way down the hall until we get into the old portion of Newmark Lab and then go down the stairway all the way to the basement. That's a very safe location. Um, probably most of you already signed the attendance sheet, but if anybody did not, could you please do so? It's um, how we get reimbursed for the pizza. So. I'll pass it around. Um, oh, yeah, one thing on this attendance sheet. If you did not receive a direct email announcement about this seminar, but you would like to in the future, please add your email address uh, legibly on there, and we'll make sure that you get onto the, um, the notification list. Uh, I'd like to take this opportunity to... Uh, welcome all of, who, all of those who are joining us via the internet. Uh, we have um, mostly by organizations, but we have a few individuals, uh, starting with Al Reinschmidt, a longtime colleague of mine. Welcome, Al. Uh, Northwestern University, <coughs> CSX, uh, Hanson Professional <coughs> Services, Railstar Engineering, CH2M Hill, um, Federal Railroad Administration. <coughs> Engineering Research Associates, Wisconsin DOT, New York State DOT, uh, Transportation Environmental Systems, uh, BNSF Railway, uh, MIT University, uh, URS Corporation, TUV Rail Services, uh, Alfred Benesh, uh, TTCI, Long list, a very popular <coughs> seminar speaker today, obviously. Uh, the Winnebago County Highway Department, um, METRA, uh, CTA, LTK, uh, Parsons, uh, Michigan Tech University, and uh, a number of other people from Wisconsin DOT. So again, welcome all of you. We're really pleased that you could join us today. Um, and for those of you who are dialing in or if you're here in person and you would like to receive um, CEUs for your participation, please either send, send L.B. Fry an email and her email address is in the seminar announcement. Um, I'll ask the speaker uh, if you could, when there are questions from the audience, if you could repeat them for the benefit of the dial-in uh, participants. I believe there is a um, ARIMA student chapter happy hour this afternoon. I think it's at the blind. Oh, there you are. So... Uh, Arima Student Chapter Happy Hour at Blind Pig on Walnut Street. I think that's 120 North Walnut. It starts at 5:30. Okay. Thank you, Matt. So the William W. Hay Railroad Seminar <coughs> Series is sponsored by the National University Rail Center here at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. And on behalf of all of us at the university, we thank the USDOT for their ongoing support for the center and the seminar series. Um, a little bit about our presentation today, um, some background. The operation of passenger and freight trains on mixed-use rail corridors has been accepted practice uh, throughout the history of railroads in North America. However, in today's railroad operating environment, freight axle loads and tonnages continue to increase, and the demand for higher speed passenger trains is also on the rise. This combination of heavy axle loads and high speeds on the same trackage presents fundamental new and unprecedented challenges in railway engineering. So this presentation is going to address these in the context of upgrading mixed-use lines for higher speeds while continuing to support freight operation. 
I can't imagine a more qualified speaker to uh, talk about this. Uh, David Staplin began his career as a summer employee of the Pittsburgh and Lake Erie Railroad in 1966 while attending the University of Michigan. After graduating with his degree in civil engineering in 1969, he was employed by the Penn Central in their engineering department. In 1974, he um, was among the elite that joined the U.S. Uh, Railway Association, United States Railway Association, um, and I say elite because there were a number of distinguished people who've had great careers since then, and Dave is, um, is one of them. Uh, at the USRA, he was responsible for developing track maintenance cost estimates <coughs> in the planning effort that created Conrail, and upon its creation in April of 1976, he went to work for them. Dave subsequently worked for CSX, Amtrak, Arima, and LTK Engineering Services before rejoining Amtrak in 2006, where he's their Deputy Chief Engineer of Track. In this role, he oversees the $200 million annual track capital budget plus the track technology and testing efforts. In addition to his responsibilities for Amtrak, Dave is uh, very active in a number of activities on behalf of the North American rail industry. He's a member of ARIMA, rail, of ARIMA committees 4 and 24, uh, TRB committee AR050, and the AAR's HAL Engineering Research Committee, the Technology Outreach Committee, and the Railway Technology Working Committee. Dave has also served on the ARIMA Board of Directors and as the Executive Director of ARIMA, which is when I first met him when we were working together in Washington. He's past president and director of the Roadmasters and Maintenance of Way Association and also a member of the ASCE. In addition to his civil engineering degree, Dave has taken courses in urban transportation at the University of Pennsylvania and completed a master's degree in business at Jacksonville University. He's a licensed professional engineer in the state of Pennsylvania. Please join me in welcoming our speaker today, Mr. David Staplin, who presents the William Hay Seminar, Moving Towards High-Speed Rail. Everybody hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Uh, so, so I have quite a bit of stuff to cover today, and I'm going to do it in three little, three segments. One short one at the beginning, then there's going to be the subject matter that's, that's printed and displayed in front of you. And then I'm going to close with just a, a, a page of advice for young uh, aspiring engineers. I learned in the, um, as an engineer that there's a time at which your testimony in court, if you have to testify the case, you can be considered an expert. The first time I was dragged in on a tax case at CSX, I still had hair, I still ran, I was in good shape. They wouldn't pass me as an expert. But now I can pass as an expert, and so that qualifies me to give you a page of advice because as an expert, you're allowed opinions. Okay. All right. So the topics to be discussed are here. I want to be remiss if I didn't give you a little state of Amtrak uh, sound bit in addition to the subject matter. I want to talk a minute about Bill Hay because have a little connection, Bill Hay. When I went to the University of Michigan, I was fortunate to be able to take our last, the last course in railway engineering that was offered there. It was taught by an Illinois graduate by the name of Don Courtright. Don Courtright uh, must have been a friend of Bill Hay because he used to refer to him, you know, in the, in the uh, just like I have, by the first name. I imagine uh, they may have maybe even been in school at the same time, I'm not sure. But anyway, um, later on, as Chris mentioned, I worked for USRA. And one of the issues at the time in, in whether or not an amalgamation of the bankrupt railroads in the Northeast could be eventually profitable was what was the ongoing maintenance burden? We were in terrible shape at the time, but once rehabilitated, what was the ongoing maintenance burden? And those of you familiar with railways know that the biggest budget items in the, uh, in the track program are rail ties and ballast. Okay. In particular, at that time, we were miserating over, and it was my responsibility to come up with an estimate for, <coughs> what would be the life of rail? Well, we had a lot of experience with jointed rail, but in 1974, um, we were only about 10 to 15 years into major installations of CWR. And at that place, nobody was replacing any. So the question was, how long was this going to last? So. We found some of the older installations in the in the Northeast and went out and looked at them, you know, measured headwear and stuff like that. And from the headwear, you could conclude that, geez, these are going to be here for another 900 years. But 
We knew already from, from hearing from Australia that there was a phenomenon called fatigue, which was likely to be an issue as well. And so I made some estimates and actually picked up the phone one day and called Professor Hay, introduced myself. I think I had met him before, but anyway, I reintroduced myself. We talked a bit. He said what I was doing, and then I you know, ran these, some ideas by him. He was very kind, listened to what I had to say. He said, well, it all sounds very reasonable. I think, you know, I think it's okay. So that was my first direct experience with him. As president of the Roadmasters in 1984, we, we uh, I'm sorry, 1985, 1986, we did a big show in Dallas, and we brought uh, Bill Hay down to recognize him as an honorary member. Um, and then finally, as executive director of ARIMA, in bridging the time in which ARIMA was merged from the AREA, Roadmasters, PNB, and all those associations into one organization, um, and where it is today, um, it occurred to me as executive director that everybody had awards. Every, every week, almost, on television, they have an award show um, for something, okay? And at that time, the Civil Engineering Association, AFC, if I'm not mistaken, uh, had started a series of awards, and I believe they're called the Opal Awards, for outstanding civil engineering achievements. Well, I said, you know, the railway industry, railway industry is really very good. It's, 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 it's sort of good, but it's quiet. You know, not many people understand how clever <coughs> railway engineers really are. It used to be said, and I think it's still true, that generally railway engineers can do for a dollar what it takes most of everybody else two bucks to do. So I said, you know, wouldn't it be good for this fledgling organization if we had some kind of an award? So I thought, well, if we had an award, who would we name it for? Well, that was a no-brainer. You know, we had Bill Hay. Wouldn't it be great to name it after him? And wouldn't it be good if we could get some of his former students to sit as a group and um, pour over maybe submissions um, for an annual award. So most of Dr. Hayes' students at that time were still very busy in their jobs, but there was one individual who came to mind, Ron Drucker. And uh, those of you who may know Ron Drucker, he was chief engineer at the merger of the Seaboard and the Chessie the chief engineer of the Chessie and later became a unit president of CSX. And Ron retired at a fairly young age uh, down to Key Biscayne, Florida. So I went through my ARIMA directory and found his phone number, picked up the phone and called him and uh, chatted a bit, caught up on old times, and uh, asked him if he would be gracious enough to serve um, a blue ribbon group to come up with um, and select from nominations um, for an award that would be named in honor of Bill Hay. And he graciously accepted to do that. And I think probably for three or four years he did it, I'm guessing. And he since handed that over to uh, Dable Hands with Mike Frankie, as <coughs> many of you have probably heard speak. So that's how we got the Dr. Hay Award. And I think it's fitting, and on the screen, I want to mention. In addition to that, there was a generation of railroaders. If you hear about the great generation on TV, it's usually the people who fought in World War II and you know, came through a very severe depression, economic depression in the country. And then as they became young adults, went overseas to fight and came back and helped make the United States an industrial powerhouse. Uh, so they, but there was a great generation of railroaders in my estimation and those are the people that bridged the industry from the end of World War II, kind of up until the mid 70s and 80s, because in that time, the government was all about building highways. And geez, if you talk about subsidized Amtrak, they were directly <coughs> subsidizing the operation of regional airlines to encourage growth in the airline industry, because we had developed this huge infrastructure to build airplanes during World War II, and those people needed something to do. So, the government was all about subsidizing other modes. And the railroad industry had a real tough go of it. For those of you who haven't seen it on YouTube, there's a video that was done, but it's originally done as a movie, and there were only a very limited number of copies by the Penn Central trustees. And it was done to show Congress that if they didn't act quickly, 
1974, there was going to be no Conrail because the physical assets of the Northeastern Railroads were in such disastrous conditions. Some of you may have seen that video. If you haven't, you can Google it up and, uh, and look at it. And these are the names on the screen of just a few of the leaders, industry leaders, who got us from the end of World War II through those dark days until Conrail was formed, Amtrak was formed, and we had deregulation of the Staggers Act and a lot of bright people who have now kind of put the industry back on a firm footing. And uh, so we want to remember those people because they're the people that got us to where we are today, an industry that's enjoying quite a bit of a renaissance and rebirth. Okay, so that's, that's that part. And I want to talk a little bit just about Amtrak. You've all seen the system map. You know what it looks like. Amtrak had a very good year in 2013. Ridership was up again, in spite of two major service disruptions on the Northeast quarter. Um, revenue was up even more than ridership. And um, that's 10 out of 11 years in a row that the ridership has been on the increase, which includes the, the economic downturn in 2007, eight, nine. So pretty good record. Clearly people want to ride trains uh, when their service is offered, it's adequate. And if you looked at placed us in ridership with airlines, we'd be the sixth largest um, in terms of the number of people carrying. Considering the fact that in a lot of parts of the country, the service is one train a day, that means where we do have a lot of service that we're a much stronger force. Okay, ridership by business line. You see here that in the Northeast quarter is approximately 12 million riders a year. And you can see the growth since 1998. The short quarters, 15 million. And you can see that the rate of growth there has been even higher. And then the long haul trains, which soldier on, usually one a day on a route, whatever route they serve, even the long haul trains, we've had an increase in the ridership of. Financial performance, people ask me, well, what is the government shutdown going to do to you? Well, in the long run, we get a lot of capital from the FRA, so it would be a problem, but in the short haul, we can actually, out of the fare box, we recover 81% of our cost, which for a passenger railroad is very high, uh, very high indeed. And on all operations, it's 88%. So if you look at the operating cost and you figure in depreciation on a cash basis, it's almost almost break even. And in the interim, also in the in the in the last uh, last dozen or 10, 10 or dozen years, we've also lowered the corporate debt. As you can see from 39 billion, 3.9 billion and 1.4 billion. So clearly the Boardman administration and Amtrak has been their focus on making this a business and making decisions on a business-like matter. Okay, now on to inner city rail, the meat of the subject. Okay, there's there's three general classifications that I'm gonna posit today. And I know that there are formal definitions out there that are a little different than these, but I'd like you to think of three classifications. The traditional inner city rail, which is basically bound by 79 mile an hour operations, higher speed rail from 80 to 125, and sometimes in the Northeast quarter, we have little bursts of 135 to 150. Um, I'm sorry, and that, that Amtrak's 125 to 150 was a little separate category. And then true high speed, and those of us at Amtrak, we kind of feel like, hey, by Watch Rodney Dangerfield, one of the great comedians. Okay, you should see some of his old routines. But anyway, his big deal was he'd grab his tie and tell people, I don't get no respect. Okay, so I say the true high speed rail will always be 10 miles over whatever our highest and fastest train is. Okay, this market picture has been repeated a lot of times. I don't even put numbers on it exactly just to show and it's been shown a number of times in different venues. This one happens to be taken from a Mercer management report that was done for the house. But clearly when, when the travel time is in the two to three hour time range, rail grabs a huge share of market versus air. There are other figures also on highway traffic. It also makes a dent on the highways. Higher speed rail can pull some of the same numbers, percentages, um, 
but it won't it won't achieve on longer runs it's not going to achieve these kind of travel times but it can still it can still work in this range and 50 to 50 percent 40 to 60 percent of market share is still pretty pretty darn good in addition higher speed rail generally makes a few you know, more intermediate stops than true high speed so for example in illinois and springfield you can get to chicago pretty quick on higher speed rail once that system is done so you're probably not compete there so much against the airline as you will be the automobile. But clearly, clearly it can pull significant numbers by itself and perhaps someday pave the way with true high speed rail. Okay, the traditional rail, the 79 mile an hour, and this is where I'm going to go into what what should why should this be of interest to engineers and what's what's interesting about this kind of middle middle part of the of the rail segment the traditional inner city rail we kind of we kind of did that for years and we we all know that what that's about some of us worked in the air when that was still in the uh, the private sector and the technology and everything's pretty well understood the only thing that's really different these days is the fact that uh, ptc is is going to be mandated on some lines because of passenger service being there okay and one advance. All right. High speed rail also is a, is a mature technology now and if you want to have high speed rail, if you can afford it and you can get people to agree to build it, you know, you can go offshore and you can buy a system from Asia or, or Europe, any one of several systems. The key thing here is the rolling stock and infrastructure are almost, or they're designed as a system. And, you know, they have to be married together. Whereas in the old technology, the 79 mile an hour, the interchange rules for equipment meant that equipment on railroad A could go on, a, on railroad B as long as everybody was following interchange rules. High speed, it's a little different. Okay. Okay. The key here is that it doesn't really mix well with freight. It's not that it can't physically mix, but to justify high speed rail, you need very high traffic densities which means that your trains are going to be running frequently. I think on the original segment of the uh, French route from Paris to Lyon, the headways are now on the order of three, four, five, six minutes. Okay? So the easy example is to say that if you had a 200 mile per hour train covering 15 miles, it would be there in 15 minutes. Um, the 50 mile an hour freight train is going to take 60 minutes, so that freight's going to eat four to five high speed rail slots. And that's that's not not going to be acceptable for the level of the service. Um, it isn't that they physically don't fit together. It's just that the reality of the service demands um, make it unlikely that you're going to have success doing that. Okay, so higher speed rail, on the other hand, is also operated worldwide. In Europe, they call these classic lines. Um, they operate at uh, at speeds of uh, 200 kilometers an hour, 160 kilometers an hour, and they provide more service to intermediate points than does high-speed rail because once you start stopping on high-speed rail, it's no longer high-speed rail. And what's interesting now is that a lot of the, uh, especially in Europe, the investment in the classic lines has slowed down to pay for high-speed rail, and that's caused political problems in some of the regions of those countries. Who haven't seen service improvements are now seeing older equipment or higher failure rates. We were heading that way before World War II. The railroads needed something to counter the increase of use of audio of the auto. If you look at ridership statistics, especially in the East, which was a higher density population, the ridership started dropping about 1920. Um, and that's no coincidence because that's when state highway departments were formed, roads were being built, and Henry Ford made the car affordable. So the railroads, the railroads in the depression came up with their 
Hiawatha trains, there are Zephyr trains, fast sleeping trains to stop that erosion of ridership in key markets. And they were doing pretty well at it till World War II came along and everybody had to stop and focus on the war effort. And after the war, as I said, the focus went all the highways and airports, so it didn't matter anymore. The technology is there. Um, and the, uh, on the other hand, I would say the development of infrastructure that's, that would be uh, associated with that uh, type of service pretty well, that developed pretty well stopped along about 1950. So as a young engineer, if you want to practice traditional passenger rail, it's codified pretty well. You can get an Arima manual. You get your Hay textbook, either version earlier when actually it might have some interesting stuff in it. High speed rail, you go abroad and buy it. And it's pretty well codified. And um, as long as you don't mix components like rolling stock from Asia with maybe European track, they all, it all is happier if it's put together as a system. And the issue will be environmental and regulatory getting people who agree to build it, first of all, and finance it, um, and then making sure you satisfy the, the uh, federal regulations um, in terms of the equipment and, and right away. Higher speed rail, on the other hand, doesn't fit either of those molds, so it requires the thinking man or thinking woman uh, to make it work, because it, it, you, know, you can't use um, sort of the what I'll say, what's been codified in the past. And as I say here, you either you challenge the standards to either prove them to be correct or unfounded, and then you change them. And you can still, you still have to mix new and old and usually freight and passenger as well. So while it's clear that high-speed rail is needed in the U.S. in some markets, and God knows California certainly needs it, um, the, the barriers to building it overcoming to build the first system are considerable. Some, a lot of them are political and financial. They're certainly not technical. Okay. But as you can see from the ridership tra trends in the short quarters of Amtrak, there's clearly a potential for higher speed rail on some markets. And the initial investment is likely to be maybe not an order of magnitude, but close to a cheaper than high speed rail. And it fits especially well on freight lines where there's low, um, low traffic density. And moving to the Midwest, the examples you're probably all familiar with, um, in development now, Chicago to St. Louis, Chicago to Detroit, um, in limbo, but someday going to probably be revisited, Chicago to Twin Cities, um, and other lines uh, possibly fit the model um, there's a low density CSX line, for example, between Chicago and Indian Indianapolis, um, which probably would support higher speed rail and coexist just fine with a lighter freight tra traffic. And of course, in the East, we're working on projects, New Haven to Springfield and New York to Albany and beyond. So incremental development is possible with higher speed rail. Just list a bunch of stuff here. I'm not going to go over every point, but you can incrementally develop it. Um, the ridership comes as you gradually reduce uh, running time. There are physical things that you do to do that. You can operate, operate higher camp efficiency, which again is a good thing that allows freight and passenger to mix, um, and so forth and so on. As I note here, as developed, it may someday make a case for true high speed rail. You think about Japan, for example, the original high speed line. Um, Tokyo to Osaka built, I think it would open in 1964, um, extended many times, new high speed lines in other parts of the country. You go back to Tokyo to Osaka, the original city pier, main city pier, now a market for even faster, potentially faster maglev. So it isn't unheard of that you would build something and then 20 or 30 years down the road say, we need, we need better now. So Higher speed rail doesn't preclude high speed rail. So a couple different approaches. The Chicago to St. Louis, there was high investment on the head end in a completely new track structure, um, new turnouts and everything. There was capacity built in for developing intermodal business, which the UP hopes to have. 
Um, the dispatching and ownership stay with UP. Detroit to Chicago, um, lower investment on the head end because the, the, uh, the uh, I won't say the money was all gone by the time Illinois got it, but uh, there was, to just put it this way, the, um, the people in Michigan decided to buy a piece of the railroad, which ate up about $140 million from Norfolk Southern. So there was less left over. Therefore, we're running, basically we're staying with wood ties for now. The older CWR on the line, some of which I mentioned here is actually a non-controlled pool, not a lot, but a little bit. And the, the, the ballast foundation is actually still largely limestone. A few capacity improvements initially, but the ownership and the dispatching are in public hands. So the pluses and minuses are, if you go the Chicago-St. Louis route, your higher front cost will make lower maintenance costs down downstream for that initial investment. Um, it may also mean that later investment uh, by, by having that investment up front, not having it later on, there'll be fewer service disruptions. And um, the disadvantages are that federal funding sometimes doesn't come in that big a block. And the freight ownership, if you want to run more service, you go back to negotiations. And if you want to run more trains, you, know, you probably got to build more improvements or you got to do something else. <laughs> Chicago to Detroit, um, the public owns the facility now, so it controls the standard, the dispatching, and the level of service. Um, but on the other hand, states aren't really well equipped to own and manage railroads yet. Um, they will be better in the future, um, certainly. Uh, but most of them, their highway departments, their transportation departments, while they deal somewhat with short lines, the move over to passenger rail at a higher speed is, is a challenge. Um, and uh, I expect programs like this maybe will solve that in the future by providing bright young folks to, to go do that work. And also the states don't necessarily have the ongoing matching funds set up on a continuing basis to do the additional capital upgrades. All right, so now I want to go to some barrier removal for higher speed rail, which is what what kind of work would engineers do? What makes higher speed rail sort of challenging vis-a-vis -vis the traditional or true high speed? So here are some examples, as I know here, that I'm going to run through quickly. And some of these, if you saw the, there were a lot of you I know in the railroad group that went to the uh, Arima conference, if you saw my presentation, a few of these are going to be similar. Um, road beds, for example, all right? Current standards for modern high speed or higher speed would, would argue for roadbed standards that don't exist on most classic lines. Now the pointer was kind of, uh, looks like it's a battery you might be giving out, but yeah, okay, it's all right. So we're dealing with roadbeds that look like this, and this is what we want. But here are wetlands and here are right-of-way limits. You try to do this work environmentally on a categorical exclusion, if you go there, you're into heavyweight environmental work. Okay, so it's a big advantage not to go there if, if at all possible. Okay, cut sections pretty much the same way. So what you do, what you do is you build, you build some retaining walls. Um, you use excess material to fill a little bit out where you can. You know, you do everything you can. Some of these analyses we've done for New York. In Connecticut, on the their redouble tracking lines, we actually go cut section by cut section and, and reviews to find ways to stay within the categorical exclusion limits on the roadbed. And the tools you use to do that, you're familiar with this. This is a LIDAR photo. What's interesting about this is this is LIDAR from the northeast corridor. That's our route. You can see the old line there, the old roadbed. From a line relocation. The rest of the LIDAR came from the county in Maryland that we run through. This is near Perryville, Maryland, the mouth of the uh, Susquehanna River where it, it opens up to Chesapeake Bay. So you have these wonderful tools now that you can use to, to develop roadbed solutions. This is another LIDAR shot of, uh, I believe this is the Springfield line. You can see, um, you can see the slopes and you can see what you're dealing with. 
um, from a macro level. Okay, roadbed drainage, some of the old lines. This is the Springfield line. You see there's no ditch line here. It's an overhead bridge, so that's not unusual. And usually on overhead bridges, you're talking about a 16 foot setback. But again, because some of these lines are very old, they're not built to that standard. So there isn't room for a drainage ditch through here. And when we put the other the track back on the other side of the right of way, you can see from the cross section down there, not a whole lot of room there either. This was actually compiled both with LIDAR and ground penetrating radar, which gives you the substructure. So what do you do? Okay, well you, you work imaginative drainage solutions. Again, could we put a big ditch over here? Sure, if we own the property, but if we don't, and uh, there's a business there or something, a private residence, whatever, you gotta find an ultimate solution. So these are very challenging from engineering design. Then when we go into the track substructure, um, Jim Heisler gets a lot of mileage out of these photos of his vehicle. So I got to mention just as a, uh, you know, to give equal time that, that uh, um, PB also does this work now. So just that's my equal. Uh, yeah, Chris. In the picture on the left, which one's faster? <laughs> that was a rhetorical question right there. <laughs> okay. But you can use GPR on the existing old roadbed as well as the track. Okay. And from the existing track and the old track, you can develop a composite picture, oops, of what it looks like, which would be something like this. And in this case, we found out the existing track had a ballast pocket in it, which was good to know before we put the second track back in and maybe uh, maybe altered the drainage. And so the question is, okay, now you found a ballast pocket. Is that significant? So we take we take the geometry car and we look at the running roughness, and guess what? When you overlay that, you can see the running roughness profile jump up on that spot. So yeah, it's significant. You need to do something about it. This is the oops. This is an overhead picture of the same location um, on the railroad. The old second track here is actually an industrial lead. Okay, let's move. So you use the tools, all these wonderful tools. And again, it goes back to basic engineering design, not codified, but situation specific. So you got to know your stuff. Okay, barrier removal, track structure. We wish the whole railroad looked like this. I think I pinched this from one of Conrad's old presentations. But in Michigan, it looks like this. CWR, some of which, most of this rail dates from the 40s. It's been re-welded. You got wood ties. And you got limestone with a veneer now of uh, better, better rock materials over top. That's what you're dealing with. That's a 110 mile an hour track right there. And uh, I usually, every time we run the geometry car, I usually let Chris know. And uh, some of the students and some of the faculty affiliates have actually come out and, and uh, ridden the line. It actually rides pretty good. So the track is, you know, if you look at the track components in the US, we have pretty good rail, um, strong rail. Uh, there's a little few straightness issues still from the manufacturers, which affect the well quality. <laughs> And that translates back to ride quality, but they're working on those. One of the mills, and at least I think one of the mills in Asia now, one of the best at mills, I should say, is now rolling rails in longer lengths, which helps eliminate that problem. So preaching to the choir here, concrete ties could use some help. Now, we've had a lot of problems with concrete ties. And uh, say here, the concrete design needs a physic, which really is a polite way of saying it needs to be taken from a, a black art form to a true science. Unfortunately, the FRA and some other people have funded work here in Illinois. We're on our way to doing that, I do believe, and uh, long overdue. The ballast, again, research in Illinois, other places, is taking us the right, the right direction, I believe. The special track work still needs some help, OK? Well, I've said that wood ties will suffice when you get to track special work. If you want faster, higher, um, higher quality turnouts, you really need to go to concrete. Okay. 
The concrete ties and turnouts have been very stable and successful. But what you need is you need better geometries to push higher speeds through those. And you need uh, these particular features I'll talk about in a minute are hollow steel ties, which contain the switch rods. So the tamper can actually come along here and tamp without all the rods and stuff being in their ways. We have rollers, advanced rollers on the switch, which means you don't have to use lubricants. Lubricants, not just because we want to be green, but because the lubricants eat up the rubber pads between the concrete ties and the, uh, the cast plates, switch plates. So the things we fixed so far on our turnout design, the hollow steel ties, we've taken the quarter inch rise that's in the arena manual of the point over the stock rail out because it's a speed bump at higher speed. We have a positive hold down on the stock rail from those from the uh, special switch plates, um, which obviates the need for that quarter inch. Um, the heel connection, which I'm going to talk a little bit more uh, about in a minute, and then the switch rollers. So the thing's still in the work, better geometry, better conformal contact for the switch points. So when the throats of the wheel hit the switch point, they're not going to be hitting edges. They're going to be hitting shapes that are conformal with the throats of the wheel. And um, we have a solid frog. It doesn't have a slip joint in it, but that's proved somewhat troublesome. Keeping, uh, it takes two machines to muscle it over, and the benefits on the turnout side aren't that high. So we're probably going to go back to a slip joint, which is a common uh, design overseas. Still needed, better transition and track modules, better sensors for signal integrity, better power mechanisms. Okay, let's go back to the forged heel. This is a case where high axle loads and higher speed uh, had a little trouble mixing. So, in the high speed turnouts, the, there's a transition between the special switch point section and the regular closure rail. You can see here that there's a step in there, a compromise, and there's also a flash well. That's all in one crib. What happened is with the heavy axle load, you may notice some flattening in here. Because this is done as a forging, there's a heat affected zone, and it causes batter in the differential and hardness. You can see it here again. You can see the widening of the running band, and that led to this fracture. So the heavy axle loads mostly responsible for the <coughs> flattening, the speeds of the trains, because we instrumented these things, cause this once that occurs. So now we have a CNC piece of rail steel that connects the two, two flash wells, spread it over four cribs, three or four cribs. And so far, although it's, it's I won't say it's ungodly expensive, compared to having a failure like that, it's pretty cheap. But, you know, that's, that's how we solve the problem. That's an Amtrak development. Miter rails. On high speed rail, you wouldn't have movable bridges, but we have them. We have a bunch of them. If we had 10 or more, just on a quarter. So the miter rail is where the lift span or the movable span meets the fixed land span. You've got to have a transition. This is an old Conley AMS, which is austenitic manganese steel. It's the same material that frogs are made out of, rail bound frogs. And um, this, is, this is how it operates. Okay, it lifts up, allows this, the spans and to separate. These are pretty much 40 mile an hour devices or lower. And again, when you try to run faster on, because the speed at Niantic is 60. It doesn't say it works exactly, but anyway, um, you wind up with fractures like that. All right, so what we did at Niantic, we went to a, a rider system, which was developed by Conrail and a company called CMI Promix. Um, over in New Jersey, and I think they're, they both feel like they have a patent on this, and I'm not sure which one's right, but um, anyway, you can buy them. And the uh, thing to notice here is that what happens, this little block raises the back of the wheel up and over the gap between the running rails, what's called rider system. That's what you'll see me refer to as. 
The rider design is a quarter inch. If you look in the center, center line of the gap, the rider rail is a quarter inch above the surface of the running rail. And it has a guard in there to prevent any, any, any flanges from picking it. Well, that worked pretty good for the freight industry. It was better than the Conley rails um, that we took out in Niantic, but it has a problem. It's another picture. You can see the crown in the block, the rider block here, quarter inch. It batters down the less. Well, we have these AEM7 electric locomotives in the in the wheel set traction motor combo is about 52,000 pounds, if I'm correct. Right, Thanks, 52,000. Anyway, it's a load. And so you think about you're moving a wheel set and it's inertia, it wants to keep it moving in one, one direction. Now you put that quarter inch bump, and it's got to raise up at 60 miles an hour, you get a big impact. And we couldn't keep the signal jewelry that indicated that the miter rails were in place in operation there because of the impacts and the vibration. So the uh, group that worked for me, the fellow by the name of Mike Thomas, who parenthetically won the Birch Award uh, given by NARC for safety this year for uh, some instrumentation he did in support of uh, uh, Gary's people up at the uh, Volpe Center and trying to trap some bad actor equipment. Went out and put some accelerometers out here, and the accelerometer bays came and said, well, this shouldn't work at all. We didn't need to measure the forces, and you really couldn't do that in an asymmetric shape, but it, you know, it was, the accelerations were awful. So Mike Tresino and I were sitting there one day over our morning cup of coffee, and we said, why does the thing have to raise the wheel? Why couldn't we drop the running surface out from under the wheel and keep the rider rail flat? So that's what we did. Roddick said it would never work. Well, we put it in Niantic. We put a set in Niantic, and the, we remeasured the accelerations. And basically, I mean, you would have to, it's, a, it's probably a logarithmic, but basically the, the vibration level, I think, dropped by two thirds. And so we can then again run 60 miles an hour. Now, Niantic, if you saw the presentation, that uh, Rima has been replaced, but that was. Uh, that was to get it to live a little longer and keep the service going. Okay, the next thing I want to talk about, getting near the end now, is trap geometry, other barrier removals. So, um, on higher speed rail, you need to be able to analyze vehicle behavior and in a separate away from using pre existing standards like the FRA standards, which are really safety standards. Say, well, okay, if you want to run class six or something, can you use class eight as your maintenance standard? You could do that, but um, it would be, you'd still not be happy. So we've seen poor vehicle behavior on track variations that are one half of the safety standard for the class or even less. They're not discernible by eye, so the track inspectors can't necessarily go out there and identify these. And the root cause may not always even be evident from the geometry card data, the raw data. And these variations are certainly not seen by the reference systems that the tampers carry on board to surface track with. So what do you do? Okay, use VTI models and you use the filtered track geometry card data to see the problem and it's often rolling stock specific, which in a mixed environment could mean a locomotive, could mean a brand of car, or could mean could mean a lot of different things. First of all, before we get there, you got to measure track quality to begin with. There are a lot of people who have written extensive PhDs, and I don't want to denigrate those about ride quality with, with uh, track quality indices, but at the end of the day, if the track's level and straight, it rides good. So if it's not level and straight, you can measure that as an indication maybe you need to do something. So what we did, we developed an internal index, which is simply um, profile deviation taken over 124 foot cord. Again, a difference between conventional and, and passenger and that's a longer cord. You need a longer cord to find things. And then we add to that the cross level variation at that point. Because we run the railroad every two weeks, we can measure every foot of the railroad every two weeks. We can actually watch this trend, these trends change over time. 
and we use as a benchmark for comfort 10% exceedance. If you got down here into the 1% level, you'd be talking about a defect that would be closer to FRA limits. So you have to be able to measure the railroad to begin with. So high-speed rail, how do they do this with high-speed rail? Wouldn't you just do whatever they do? Okay, the problem is they do it. It's, it's pretty expensive. It's very effective. But they use fixed reference systems along the right-of-way. And the tamper is actually surfaced to the fixed reference to the original design. Um, it's expensive. And the references are usually catenary poles. They're on catenary poles. And, of course, on a diesel operated rear, there are no catenary poles. So you'd have to create the whole reference system. The freight railroads have traditionally op, you know, relied on the tampers and the internal cord references systems, and they've probably been effective, at least for the speeds most freight operates. The higher speed rail, we can't, can't really live with either one of those. And um, the high speed thing would drive costs out through the roof. Uh, you'd have to create, again, the, the whole reference system. The short cord uh, just is not adequate to pick up vehicle dynamics. So um, now the reason I'm going to spend just a minute on this is that one of your former students here is involved in doing a lot of the work that I'm about to, about to show you. Okay, so you can use a geometry car to diagnose the issues if you apply filters to where you can see patterns, repetitious patterns. We've got a new tamper control software that we've uh, we're using from basically was developed from British Rail Research, which also didn't have the money to go to the fixed reference system. And the results in solving particular cases with this combination have been really good. So raw geometry car data, but problem location. So you'd say, okay, we go out and tamp right here, we'll be in good shape. We'll take that deviation out. Now notice that's minus an inch plus plus three quarters. So you can probably see that one by eye too. When you put the space curve filter on, what you find out is there's a cyclic error in the track. So when we tap that bad spot, guess what? It just came back. And it didn't ride very good even the day after we tamped it. So now we can see that there's a, there's a, uh, there's a perturbation here that has maybe two, three, four cycles and it exists over a significantly longer uh, distance. That particular example was taken off the plat platform of New Carrot in Washington. Okay, here's another example. This is an alignment example, um, one that we found that's north of Baltimore in an interlocking, which unfortunately is on a curve, but it's, it serves a freight facility and it's a busy freight facility. We can't, we just can't move it. So we have this system on the Acellas. It measures ride quality, it's the RMS system. It runs every day, most of the train sets have them. And when you get, when you get a certain number to a certain value, either lateral or vertical, it prints you out you know, an exception. Now, mostly these aren't safety exceptions, but you can see at this point, the trend line is you know, going down the road to where there would have eventually been a safety issue here. But in the meantime, the passengers are getting jostled around. Okay, so we put the alignment, the alignment filter on it. These points, you don't have to worry about them, but basically these are points of turnouts in the interlocking. And there's big variations in here, but there's also there's also several um, several cycles. The original tamper solution focused on the big deviation. They went in, they probably did this place three times with no no improvement. Okay, once we opened it up. To a longer cycle with the TGS TGCS system, we were able to go in and identify it. This is a before and after with a geometry car. Um, this area in here involved the common frog area, the common ties between the frog, and the tamper crew refused against orders to move this. So it, it stayed in, but the big deviation got out and enough of the rest that the RMS values went to zero. Okay. Could the conventional software on the tampers have done this? Um, the tampers that do this have the class or AGGS system. They can, but in long wavelengths, what they tend to try to do is they tend to try 
to fix the rest of the railroad to the deviation instead of fixing the deviation of the railroad. And when you have four tracks together, you start talking about throws of two inches. Now you're into track center problems, which is what was prescribed by the conventional software. This advanced software, which actually pretty well fixed the problem, the throws were much less, but spread out over a longer area. So the lessons we've learned in geometry, um, basically list them, list them here. Um, they do develop, these ride comfort things develop within the safety limits. Um, you can use the geometry car as long as you use filter data to show where the problem is and also the extent of the problem by the length of the number of cycles, repetitious cycles. The tamper software won't get it by itself, even though they can go out to 400 feet because the window throws become too large. And like I said, they tend to fix the railroad to the deviation rather than vice versa. And the operators know when they see those large throws, they know they can't move the track, so they don't implement them. And so better software is definitely needed. The one that we have working is, is one. I'm sure there could be others. Okay, so that's what we do every day at Amtrak to accommodate faster and faster trains on older roadbeds uh, in a mixed service environment. The last thing I told you I was going to do a little a little editorial on, on young for advice for young engineers. The first one is in your engineering education is if you if you get really good at what you're doing, you can sort of take the process back. And the process that I'm referring to is all the stuff that it takes to get things done anymore. Because in a lot of cases, engineers are being marginalized by professional planners. Sorry, it's editorial, but it's true. My law, which I'm sure other people have thought of, which is that progress is proportional to one over the amount of process. So we need to shorten process. So we need engineers who are capable of being on top of their technical game, who can articulate and who can explain trade-offs to non-technical people to take the process back, the planning process back. And uh, I think your program here is, is doing a great job at that. Um, I heard Samantha's presentation on the grade crossing safety at Arena, which was terrific. And the last thing is you treat your profession as you would citizenship by being active in your professional associations. And the payback, the associations of the people you meet is far more than the effort that you put out. So that's it for the day. Any questions? So that's a little of the techie stuff we do, as well as the, you know, some of the broader brush stuff. And uh, like I said, a lot of that alignment work that you saw, um, there's, there's more work that John Winnick is now doing in Michigan to try to match tamper um, output from campers with geometry card data so you can actually put them in a common, common frame. Tampers usually work on a core to somewhere around 70 feet. So you get mid-ordinate values that are based on a certain a certain repetition. The placer units, for example, the, uh, the the calibration of stations is something like two. They're not even metric. It's something like 2.9 feet. The cords on the geometry car, you know, we can do 62, 124, and all that. Uh, but when you use space curve, when you reduce the data, um, he's found a way to actually replicate a 62 foot cord. What the tamper measures, what the geometry car measures, so. You can use a geometry car to look in ahead at curves that you know, are going to need work and changing to get the speed up. And the, port, the problem with geometry car data and spirals is most of them work on the rate gyro where the rate, the rate of change is being picked up and they don't pick up the subtle differences at the start of a spiral. So doing spiral design off of geometry car data is really hard. Yep. A couple questions. Uh, I should probably know the answer to this, but I'm in Chicago and Detroit line. Exactly. State bought the track. Sorry, the state bought the track. What's We're the their contract track? operator. What's the traffic mix on that? It's, there's still a trade on that model, right? There is, yeah. And is it primarily, is it primarily passenger and family trade? Well, 
Um, <laughs> North, it, the North and Southern had alternate routes to the Midwest to Chicago and all that. So for several years, there really hasn't been a lot of through freight. On our end of the line, we have an ethanol plant um, over towards Kalamazoo. We have local freight. Um, on the eastern end that they bought, um, there's still a busy auto plant at Wayne, Michigan. And so there's actually being a second track constructed, so they maintain unfettered um, access to the auto plant. Um, there is there are local businesses on the line. Um, the locals run in between the passenger trains because right now it's only three trains a day each way east of Battle Creek. Hopefully someday that'll increase. But by redouble tracking segments, you know you can run this capacity business for a long time and be able to uh, to be able to handle both. Now the limestone and the track structure, if if someday somebody came out and said we're going to build a refinery on this line, or or whatever that would require unit train operation, um, then you'd have to think about an undercutting and cleaning program. We probably run the TLM then and convert it to concrete. So you know it's in a sweet spot, which is why it works. Chicago, St. Louis, on the other hand, they were looking at a more immediate growth of intermodal traffic, so it made sense to do what they did. The change right over the concrete. Could be. I mean, I think you know, in the ranges of speed we're talking about now, you know, the the need for a more robust track structure. I mean, things that are going to survive on the UP on the North Platte zone are going to be fine under mixed traffic. So, um, as far as the strength of the track, uh, as provided it's got a good subgrade foundation, I think the mixture is not that big a deal. It's it's super elevation gets a little you know a little hairy. What we have in Michigan is a line that was double tracked at one time, and when they single tracked it, that was actually done in the late 50s by the New York Central. They had a long section of double track around Niles with spring switches on each end, you know, which we now kind of turn our nose up on it. But a lot of the trains met, passenger train meets took place. When Amtrak took it over and further rationalized it, we went to the freight model of a siding every 10 miles. And uh, I just sort of disabused Dick Cogswell of this concept. So you need more sidings. No, when you're running 110 miles an hour and you want to make running meets, and this would be true if you had unit trains out there, you need much longer sections of track. Because the precision of arrivals of the trains is going to vary. And so what you need is you need a high-speed turnout into a piece of double track. We have three sidings east of miles, and uh, we put in a tiger grant for that. And you know, it's going to be a while. We didn't get it, and I appreciate why, because we got a lot to do on the rest of the line. But tying those three sidings together would give us double track all the way from Niles to halfway to Kalamazoo. Because we meet three trains a day in there now, and then you would be making running meets. You'd be going in and out of the sidings to the second track at 80 miles an hour instead of 40 or 45. So those are the kind of models you have to you, you have to work with. I mentioned to Chris earlier. One of the neat things that, uh, and, and I guess it's part of your education, the RTC, the Rural Traffic Control Model, or the Berkeley Model, you can actually play with lines and do these kind of concepts. So in terms of keeping trains moving, it may be segments of a third main where the freight, the, long, the slower moving freights can pull up, but still keep moving. Yep. We've got a couple questions. The first question is, have you heard of rail coverage defects called squats? Have I heard of rail defect called surface defects called squats? 
Yes. <laughs> <laughs> like, like rail seat abrasion in, on our railroad at our speeds and with our tonnage, we don't have them. But squats, for those that are not familiar with them, it's a surface fatigue defect that <coughs> propagates like a transverse defect in the middle of the head. It's a little like the detail fracture in terms of uh, potential danger if you leave it go. It's a surface fatigue phenomenon. I think largely seen on electrified railroads, Rod. Why would that be? Why are they more frequently? Because that, that parallels mine. I first heard of them in overseas context. But I never understood why that was. All right. So I think the cause for, so Chris is asking why would that be abroad and not in the US? And uh, I don't have a complete answer to that, but from my understanding, the, the formation of squats is a pretty complex process, maybe involving micro, you know, micro slips of the wheels and stuff like that. And, and uh, for whatever reason, you know, we don't have the kind of combination of operating conditions. Maybe it's because we have heavier equipment and we're not pushing the adhesion limits quite as far with the passenger trains as they do overseas. Uh, yeah, we have better rail. I mean, that's that's a fact. We have harder, harder steel, and it's cleaner now too. So, you know, it's thank God for the development of uh, when I started USRA. We you know that the life of jointed rail, 132 pound jointed rail, which was predominant at the time, was between four and five hundred million gross tons before the joints wore out. But then you could crop and weld it. With fatigue, when we did the planning for USRA, we thought that 800 to a billion was going to be about right. It turns out that with ingot rail, you get crushed head defects in that range, which starts you down the road toward replacement. We didn't know that at the time. We were, you know, we were sort of guessing with limited data and the blessing of Dr. Hay. And now we're seeing with the uh, obviously with the cleaner steel, you know, we're seeing we're going to see lives like two to three billion. And now we're worrying about the life of the weld. You back? Well, <laughs> when you're, you know, when you're in private enterprise, you know, you're, you're, you're in, it's like self-preservation with a human being, you know, your, your first duty as a manager is to preserve the enterprise, right? So be very careful about, about your, uh, um, your franchise and what you're doing. Um, that. The only thing I'll say in that matter is that, that we had a better, I thought, a better model going and negotiating uh, maintenance with the CP over the Madison service that was sub subsequently squashed by the governor. Um, Brent Lang, who's now the chief engineer, and I, and uh, one of Mike Frankie's people out of Chicago, Mike couldn't be there that day, Walter Lander, and, and uh, Judy Mitchell, and uh, Don Heron from the CP uh, with Mike Roney. On a landline from Calgary, we basically negotiated a joint maintenance agreement in a day in Milwaukee. And so what it what it amounts to is if you get the engineers face to face, going back to controlling the process, did I mention that? The engineers were able to work off each other's concerns to reach a consensus. Sometimes that process, you know, takes place too far. To, Way beyond an arm's length. Um, I hate to cut this off, but I know you have an airplane today. And um, unfortunately, we don't have high speed trains to get Dave swiftly <laughs> home. And so, or to the airport. And so I'm going to turn this opportunity to thank you once again. For the time. Thanks for everybody's attention and uh, good luck in your careers. We hope to see some of you at